In the 19th century, some ways of producing clothes and accessories, styles, and even the lifestyle itself not only harmed fashionistas, but even threatened their lives. Questionable hygiene, rodents, and sewage accumulation were not the only sources of epidemics in cities. Even the clothes were fraught with danger. Modern factory production made it possible to produce new fabrics every day. But before that, it was a painstaking and long process. Every item has been evaluated, remade, and resold. In the 19th century, many had to buy secondhand items from junk dealers and street vendors. But it wasn't like the secondhand stores we know today. In those days, sellers didn't really care about disinfecting clothes before selling. In 1879, the French doctor Gibbert claimed that soldiers returning from the war often carried viruses on their uniforms. Laundresses distributed them to the population, and the trade in secondhand clothes and rags was the main culprit of the smallpox epidemic. In 1899, Dr. Feeney, the chief sanitary inspector of New York, discovered that clothes of drowned people and those who died of infections were being sold from the northern states of America to the southern ones. Clothing could be a source of not only smallpox, but also scarlet fever, measles, scabies, eczema, dermatitis. Women's skirts were also a source of infection. Throughout the 19th century, the fashion for skirts with a train periodically arose. The girls literally swept the streets with them and brought infections from walks into the house. City roads were covered with dog and horse excrement saliva, phlegm, and other secretions, not to mention dust. Dot. One London doctor tried to introduce short skirts for going to the ladies' toilet. In the 1890s in the USA, women even created rainy day clubs in their support. But fashion magazines, in particular Harper's Bazaar, asked the question what about the female purpose to be charming? A compromise between health and beauty concerns became skirt clips, patented in 1902. However, gradually the skirts got rid of the train and excessive length. Their reduction is often associated with the struggle for equality. But hygiene considerations, which are often forgotten, also played an important role in this. Dot. On November 20, 1861, 19-year-old Matilda Shearer died of sudden poisoning. The girl worked in Mr. Bergeron's workshop in central London. She whipped up artificial leaves for wreaths, sprinkling them with green powder. A gorgeous shade for dresses and accessories was obtained by mixing copper and arsenic oxide. Without knowing it, Matilda inhaled the poison and wittate from her fingers during lunch. Scherer's death was described in every detail. Her vomit was green. The whites of her eyes were also green. A few hours before her death, she was convulsing. Her face expressed an extreme degree of anxiety, and foam was coming out of her mouth, nose, and eyes. The autopsy showed that arsenic had penetrated the stomach, liver, and lungs of the girl. Several charitable organizations, including aristocrats from the Women's Sanitary Association, took up Scherer's case. One of them, Miss Nicholson, even before the girl's death, visited attics and workshops where artificial flowers were made. She published a story about half dressed girls who collected leaves and flowers in bouquets at master classes. Their hands and faces were covered in sores, and their handkerchiefs were covered in blood. The young workers had no idea about the poisonous properties of arsenic, which impregnated the beautiful artificial leaves. Dr. Ange Gabriel Maxim Vernois visited several production facilities to study the technology of using arsenic. In the workshops, he discovered that the local workers were terminally ill. Toxic green dust was destroying their hands and bodies. It got under the nails caused boils on the skin, and got into food from unwashed hands. Vernois noted that there were no rodents or cats in such workshops. In the documentary, Under the Sign of Chanel, one of the employees of the fashion house says that dressmakers do not like green. Despite the fact that the properties of poisonous green were discovered over time, the attitude towards color remained not the most pleasant. So the green color has long been a bad omen, so arsenic corroded the faces, hands and feet of workers in workshops for the production of artificial flowers. Chromolithography from the book by Maxim Vernois. On the evening of September 14, 1927, in Nice, the famous dancer Isadora Duncan got into the passenger seat of an Amil car sports car. 
She wrapped a long red scarf around her neck twice, threw the free end over her shoulder, and shouted goodbye, friends, I'm going to glory. The seats in the sports car model were positioned too close to the spoke wheels. As soon as the car started moving, the scarf wrapped around the axle, pulled Dunk into the rear wheel of the car, broke her neck, and cut her carotid artery. A few moments later, Isadora was dead. The Duncan silk scarf was hand painted by designer Roman Shadoff. An American friend of the dancer Mary Deesty gave it to Isadora as a souvenir on May 1, 1927, on the birthday of her late son Patrick. Four months later, the red scarf became police evidence, and Deesty easily recognized it. Although he was soaked through with blood, in the 1970s, many elements of the 1920s style came into fashion, including long scarves. This was worn by Tom Baker in the role of Doctor Who in the television series of the same name. His character wore a long scarf while traveling to distant galaxies. But this case has more than once ended in death for those who imitated him. In 1971, a young American woman was pulled out of a ski lift chair when her scarf wrapped around a chair moving towards her. The girl died of suffocation when she was lowered down on a chairlift. Similar cases have received the name Long Scarf Syndrome in medical practice. Doctors concluded that these incidents resulted in death in 45% of cases the lame skirt forced the owner to move with mincing steps. There is even a legend about how this life-threatening clothing appeared. In 1908, the business representative of the American Company of the Wright Brothers in Europe Mrs. Hartow. Berg convinced Wilbur Wright to let her take part in a demonstration flight on an airplane. A large crowd of French spectators, including journalists, gathered to watch this performance. Berg became the first female passenger on the plane. She took to the air for two minutes and seven seconds with Wilbur Wright on October 7, 1908. In one of the photos, she can be seen in a dark suit with a skirt. Just below the knees, it is tightly tied with twine so that it does not blow up in the headwind and so that the skirt does not get stuck in the mechanism. According to legend, a local French fashion designer was inspired by Mrs. Berg's limping gait when she jumped off the seat and walked a few steps with her legs tied with a rope. So a lame skirt appeared in women's wardrobe. The peak in popularity occurred in 1910 to 1914. But the style was so impractical that the girls even refused to walk so as not to torment their legs once again. Lame skirts really caused lameness. They hugged the knees tightly and tightened the ankles. The he's diameter was less than a meter. The worst part is that these skirts have caused several deaths. In September 1910, at the Chantilly racetrack near Paris, a horse ran out of the saddle and crashed into a crowd of spectators. A woman fell under her hooves, who could not escape in time because of her narrow skirt. Her hair caught on a horseshoe, and the horse dragged her along. The woman died from fractures to her bones and skull. A year later, in upstate New York, 18-year-old Ida Goyette was walking on a bridge over the Erie Canal. She tried to step over the airlock gate, but tripped because of her skirt and fell over the low railing. The girl drowned before help arrived not all accidents ended in death, but because of the narrow skirts, fractures occurred and the self-esteem of their owners suffered. It was especially difficult for the ladies to get on the tram. Because of the skirt, they simply could not lift their leg to reach the carriage step. Lame skirt became a member of the suffragette movement. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, a feminist writer and athlete, wrote an article in which she blamed skirts in general and sucks in particular. Of course, women in skirts can sit in languid poses or keep their balance for a while. But with any movement that requires full activity of the legs, a woman in skirts is physically limited in the same way as a man in her position would be limited. Mincing, swaying gait, considered supposedly feminine, has nothing to do with gender. In these V early XIX century, the development of trade between the countries made significant changes in men's and women's wardrobe. Men began to wear gloomy black suits made of thick woolen fabrics, silk and cotton gauze, and tar linen were widely used in the manufacture of evening dresses. Light fabrics gave the image an airiness. To create an even larger volume, the material was laid in layers and impregnated with starch. The dress made of such materials was beautiful, but flammable. It burned down in less than 40 seconds. 
and the starch with which the fabric was soaked was a carbohydrate that quickly charred. This increased the combustibility of dresses. Dangerous clothes led to turbul accidents, when ladies' evening dresses burned together with their owners from an accidental spark of a candle or fireplace. One of the monuments of such tragedies is kept in the Museum Library of the Paris National Opera. In a small sarcophagus lie tattered remnants of the ballet costume of 21-year-old prima ballerina Emma Livry. During the costume rehearsal of the ballet opera The Mute from Portacy, Livry sat on a bench waiting for her exit. The dancer did not want to crumple the starched fluffy skirts and lift them over her head. Like a fan, they directed the airflow in such a way that it inflated the flame of the gas lamp in the wings. The light gauze fabric of Emma's tutu immediately burst into flames. With screams, she ran onto the stage, fanning the flames even more. One of the firefighters on duty rushed into the livery to extinguish the flames with a blanket. But already about 40% of her body was covered with burns. The ballerina lived for another eight months in turbul agony and died in 1863. Similar cases have happened before. Therefore, on November 27, 1859, a special decree was issued for French theaters. The sets and costumes had to be treated with a special solution by the French chemist Jean Adolphe Carteron. This really protected the fabric from fire, but also made it tough to the touch and worn out in appearance. Livry refused to wear ugly costumes and wrote a letter to the director of the Paris Opera, I insist, Mr. Director, on dancing at all ballet premieres in my usual ballet skirt and I take full responsibility for everything that may happen. So, the dancer preferred beauty to her own safety, and doomed herself to death in 1863. Referring to the case of Livry, chemist Eugene Chevrel published samples of flame-resistant gas fabric in the journal Le Tainterier Universal. He showed how fabric printers make light materials incombustible without compromising the beauty of their color. If it seems to you that with the progress in medicine and technology, dangerous clothes are a thing of the past, then everything is not so optimistic. Modern fashion also sometimes harms its owners and the environment. In 2009, designer Alexander McQueen released a line of accessories with spikes in the punk style. These models were made in India. Accessories could be purchased at the ASO's online store. Aggressive-looking jewelry was more dangerous from the inside. The black leather bass belt turned out to be radioactive. The spikes of these models contained cobalt-60 metal. The threat was detected at the U.S. border in December 2012 during radiation monitoring. A few months later, the belts were recalled and placed in special storage. Although the green color symbolizes nature, it has been and remains one of the most toxic in production. One of the most popular shades today is created with the help of a chemical dimalachite green. Cotton, leather, food, paper, cosmetics, medicines are dyed with it. In 2012, chemists from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology found out that when malachite green enters the body, the chemical composition of the body converts it into a more toxic form, known as the leuka base of malachite green. It can stay in the body for up to five months. Despite the fact that the toxicity of malachite green has been scientifically proven, it is completely legally used in the production of fabrics and paper. The fact is that it is still unknown whether this substance is released from textiles. Therefore, the malachite green color regularly appears on the catwalks and in our wardrobes. We love t-shirts with drawings, logos, appeals, and slogans. But many of these words and symbols are applied with the help of toxic chemicals that destroy the hormonal background in 2012. Greenpeace purchased 141 items of clothing with inscriptions and logos and tested them. Two-thirds contained nonylphenol ethoxylates and phthalates, softening plastics for screen printing on fabrics. During washing, they emit substances harmful to humans and animals. Among the dangerous goods identified by Greenpeace, you can find clothing brands Calvin Klein, CNA, Zara, Mango, and Emporio Armani. The past shows how sometimes the desire for novelty prevails over safety and health. A bright future implies the production of clothing that will protect us, not put us at risk.